Good morning, friends. Today we have a webinar on treating iron deficiency anemia with FCM. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group. It is supported by MCure and managed by Perfect Square. I request our event management team to play a small video. Thank you. So we thank Mr. Kayur Soni and the team from MCO. So thank Mr. Yash Kalpesh and their team from Perfect Square, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group. Our chief guest today is Dr. Pranta Chakraborty from Kolkata and I'm grateful to him for sparing his time. We have five very eminent guest speakers today, Dr. Amit Khurana, Dr. Malikarjun, Dr. Gopinath, Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Amita. And I'll introduce them to you at their appropriate talk. I also thank all the discussions who are eminent pediatric or adult hematologists and you participants for sparing your Sunday morning, afternoon or evening, depending upon which part of the world you belong to. To introduce you to the webinars next weekend on Saturday, 8th April from 7 p.m. onwards, IST, we have a lecture on immune mediated thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And our speaker is from USA, Dr. Spero Cataland. Next day, that is Sunday morning, 9th April, 11.30 AM, we have an ASH update on multiple myeloma by none other than Dr. Maria Matthias from Spain. To introduce our discussions for the day, and we have a large number of very enthusiastic personalities with us who have been alphabetically put up here. I'll briefly go through them. Dr. Abhilasha Sampaga from Belgavi, Dr. Akshaya Mandlai Goyal from Varanasi, Dr. Amit Jain from Mumbai, Dr. Adil Sharma from Lucknow, Dr. Arpita Gupta from Mumbai, Dr. Arun V.A. from Mumbai, Colonel Dr. Ashok Meshram from Mumbai, Dr. Ashutosh Panigrahi from Bhubaneswar, Dr. Chirasri Sanyal from Kolkata, Dr. Gopinathan from Chennai, Dr. Hamza Dalal from Mumbai, Dr. Kunal Goyal from Varanasi, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Kundan Mishra from Delhi, Mohammad Rizwan Sheikh from Delhi, Dr. Nikhil Kumar from Delhi, Dr. Nishad Dakate from Nagpur, Dr. Omkar Khanka from Mumbai, Dr. Priyanka Samal from Bhubaneswar, Dr. Prosanto Kumar Chaudhary from Kolkata, Dr. Ruchira Misra from Mumbai, Dr. Sarthak Vadera from Chandigarh, Dr. Sujata Sharma from Mumbai, Dr. Suma TL from Bangalore, Dr. Urmi Mala Bhattacharji from Chandigarh, Dr. Vinod Guru Sekharan from Trichy. And now it's time to introduce our special guest, chief guest for the day, who of course requires no introduction, Dr. Pranta Chakrabarti. To complete the formalities, he's consultant hematologist at Vivekanand Institute of Medical Sciences, Portis Hospital, Kolkata, Amri Hospital, Mukundapur, Kolkata. After completing his MD in internal medicine, he did DNB in internal medicine, and that was followed by DM in clinical hematology from Ames, Delhi. He's recipient of many national and international accolades, including Royal College of Physicians, 
International Bursary, Harold Gunson Fellowship, and Marie Curie Action Fellowship. Besides, he has received specialized training in ethics of human subject research, biostatistics from John Hopkins University, Baltimore, stem cell transplantation from King College, London. He's professional member of ASH, ISH, BT, API, and IMA. He was the scientific secretary for the 51st annual conference of ISH TM Kolkata. His areas of special interest include hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, thalassemia, and translational research. I request him to inaugurate our today's webinar and give us some words of wisdom. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. And it's a lovely opportunity to see your faces and, you know, I think wisdom comes with age. And uh, one thing I've realized it that it's an ever growing process. So let me share my story. You know, I had just completed my MD in internal medicine, was trying to practice in a small clinic in a place called Gariat in Kolkata. And next door was a very senior dental surgeon. So on the very first day, he comes to me and says, young man, I have a person with gum bleeding, but I feel that this is not the gum bleeding which I usually see. So I said, sir, what made you feel like that? He says, you know, the man feels so sick. So he brings me that person and I have a look at him. He is looking sick. He not only has gum bleeding and gum hypertrophy, but he also has echinus and pertura. So we had a small lab you know, by the side, which had a microscope. There was one technician there. I told him, can you please uh, stain his peripheral blood smear and let me have a look at it. And to my surprise, I was not even contemplating doing hematology at that time, but at least I could identify, you know, normal, abnormal cells. It was full of promyelocytes and blasts. So, I mean, the first patient I saw after doing my Indian medicine was this. And of course, as you all know that if we diagnose it early and treat it, most of the time we are not using even, you know, carpet bombing like chemotherapy, we can cure these patients. So whenever you think of hematology, the biggest advantage which I have felt after being a hematologist for around 20 years is you can clinically see a patient if you want, you can look at the blood smear, you can look at the marrow and get a complete picture. And if you ask me, you know, we are subspecialists, right? Medicine is the mother, but this subspecialty is closest to internal medicine as it can get. So most of the time in the hospitals also, the referrals, I sometimes ask them, why do you refer this case? He says, sir, because we wanted uh, opinion from an internist who is not telescoped into a super specialty. So if you want, you will not develop telescopic vision in hematology because blood flows everywhere. So the diseases are there everywhere. And the best part of this is, as you go through the training, you know, you are getting things which were in the lab, say a couple of months back. And who rules the roost in the world, you know? You think of the COVID-19 pandemic. People started thinking that you put them on ventilators and you will decrease the mortality. Then we understood what was, you know, happy hypoxia and what was the cytokine release and what was the thrombosis. So unless hematologists came into the picture, it was still very, you know, hazy. Anticoagulation, when, how, what much. And not only that, even when the vaccines came and some people developed thrombocytopenia, all the things were documented by none other than hematologists. What was happening? It was a TTP kind of thing, immunological phenomena. So, you know, we are at the crosstalk between clinics and the laboratory. And if you think of what will happen in the next 15 years, you talk of gene editing, gene therapy, you talk of CAR-T. Again, we will be there. So that is what hematology is. And it does not 
turn you into you know a scopist or something like that where you do only procedures you can keep on practicing clinically talking to the patient talking to the patient's families and you can have any age patient coming to you you can see neonates you can see 90 year old males different diseases you can follow them up and you know some of our patients become our family members we are privileged to be in this community and if you interact with us which i think you have already done you'll realize how sweet we are right so we are a group of people who understand that we do not understand everything but we try to give the best of care to the people depending on whatever we have learned whatever technology gives us whatever molecular genomics gives us and we can still be there with empathy and with a human character so welcome to the world of hematology you'll enjoy it and you will understand that we are a different species at one time we were an endangered species but now we are growing in size thank you sir for this opportunity Thank you, Dr. Pranter, for giving the correct perspective to hematology and putting it up over there where it should be. Thank you so much for your kind words. And with that, we'll begin our webinar for the day. Once again, I will uh, uh, share my screen to introduce the first guest speaker of the day. And that is Dr. Amit Khurana uh, from Surat, who has been our speaker in past, who has been anchoring number of programs he has been a great help whenever I'm not around. And Amit, I'm grateful to you for doing that job so fantastically. That's the biggest uh, tribute to you. But the formal introduction of Dr. Amit Kurana is trained in hematology from NRS Medical College, Kolkata. That was in 2014. He pursued fellowship in clinical hematology from uh, Topiola National Medical College and BYL Nair Charitable Hospital, Mumbai. And that was in 2016. He pursued fellowship in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation at Singapore General Hospital in 2017. He's a visiting consultant hematologist and meta-oncologist at various hospitals and institutions in Surat. He also works as a consultant hematologist and hemato-oncologist at Akanksha Hematology Center, Majura Gate, Surat. He's ex ordinary consultant hematologist, Lions Cancer Detection Center, Surat. He has been interested in bone marrow transplantation for various benign and malignant hematological disorders. He's going to lecture today on treating iron deficiency anemia patients having GI disorders and its treatment with IV FCM. I'll stop here and request him to take one. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me this opportunity to speak upon uh, ferric carboxymaltose in GI disorders. Actually, a big credit goes to you for ongoing CMEs and webinars in the last two and a half years period is never stopping and wonderful webinars. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to anchor multiple webinars also. So today, my topic for the day is FCM in GI disorders. So let's start with a very important disorder in our day-to-day -day life that is anemia. And when we talk about anemia, the commonest thing, anemia, which comes in our mind is iron deficiency anemia. And the most common cause of this iron deficiency anemia is anything related to gut. And that's why we are going to discuss this IV ferric carboxymaltose in gastrointestinal diseases where the patient have lots and lots of complaint with loss of appetite, swollen belly, nausea and vomiting, heartburn, abdominal pain and indigestion. So let's discuss before throwing light on IV ferric carboxymaltose in GI disorders regarding the iron homeostasis, which is a very important role to play. The whole iron homeostasis takes place at the level of duodenum. And what actually happens regarding the duodenum part of the iron homeostasis, about one to two milligram of iron is absorbed and lost every day. And the most of the absorption take place at duodenum level. There are two forms of iron. One is ferrous and ferric form. The ferrous form binds to the ferrous iron transporter, which is present at the apical brush border of the duodenal enterocytes. And the ferric iron gets converted to ferrous iron form with the help of iron reductors 
at, again at the brush border of the dendritic enterocytes from where it is absorbed. Once absorbed into the blood, it binds to the transferrin, which is then transferred to bone marrow, and it is relocated into the hemoglobin, about two thirds of the iron in the erythroid precursors. From there, it is released to multiple sites of the body, depending upon the bodily iron requirement. And what is about the iron storage? And the two most important iron storage sites is one is the liver, where about 1000 milligram of iron is stored. And another one is reticular endothelial system, where about 600 milligram of iron is stored daily. But the key regulator of iron homeostasis is this hormone that is hapsidin. What does hapsidin do? Hapsidin binds to the ferroprotein, which then binds to the jet kinase 2, which results into the phosphorylation of ferroprotein, resulting into the movement of intracellular iron into the plasma. And hence, hapsidin is a master regulator of iron absorption by modulating this ferroprotein. Once hapsidin goes high, like in case of inflammatory bowel disease, because it's an acute phase reactant, it leads to decreased iron absorption by the duodenocytes, resulting into a functional iron deficiency anemia. So regarding this ferric carboxy maltose in the treatment of GI disorders, most commonly being inflammatory bowel disease. In inflammatory bowel disease, what happens? There is increased blood loss because of multiple mucosal ulcerations, decreased absorption, and there is increased hapsidin resulting into internalization and trapping of iron in enterocytes and macrophages, resulting into the functional hypopheremia, also known as functional iron deficiency anemia. This beautiful article from GUT 2017 regarding oral versus IV iron replacement therapy distinctly alters the gut microbiota and metabolome in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. When given dietary oral iron, it alters the dominant gut vector community communities and exacerbates the chronic ileal inflammations in patients who are suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. And hence, it will be oral dangerous to give oral iron therapy to these patients who are suffering from chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So best would be to go for IV iron replacement therapy. Again, a review article from the journal Nutrients, National Management of Iron Deficiency Anemia and Inflammatory Bowel Disease. And what was concluded that IV iron replacement is of advantage in patients with aggravated IDA or flaring IBD because inflammation hampers the intestinal iron absorption. So it will be dangerous to treat these patients with oral iron therapy because of ongoing inflammation. Regarding the adverse events after IV iron infusion among inflammatory bowel disease studied in the period of 2010 to 2014 and published in August 2018, it was well concluded that only about 1.3 of 100 IBD patients ever develop any adverse events. And because the adverse events are so rare, the physician should be encouraged to adhere to the recommended guidelines for IV iron replacement therapy among anemic IBD patients. So IV FCM in IBD rapidly corrects the anemia, overcomes the low adherence of oral iron, bypasses the negative role of hapsidin effect on duodenal enterocytes, has a very quick absorption, larger doses of, of iron can be administered at one go, it has got improved absorption even in the setting of acute inflammation and very, very safe, effective, and well tolerated. This beautiful article from Digestive Disease and Sciences, which showed improved hemoglobin response with ferric carboxymaltose in patients who have gastrointestinal related iron deficiency anemia versus oral iron therapy, where about 191 patients with GI related iron deficiency anemia were enrolled. And what was seen, there was maximum hemoglobin response with ferric carboxymaltose as compared to any other iron agents with very minimal adverse events and very minimal serious adverse events. And was well concluded again that ferric carboxymaltose is very effective therapy in patients with IDA who have GI disorders and has a safety profile comparable to that of other IV iron agents. That you can see over here, this is ferric carboxymaltose and this is iron sucrose. The mean increase of the hemoglobin is remarkable and very fast within two to four weeks period with ferric carboxymaltose as compared to iron sucrose therapy. Again, a randomized clinical trial comparing IV versus oral iron for the treatment of anemia after acute GI bleed. And what was seen that ferric carboxymaltose had wonderful complete response rate at day 21 of about 85%, whereas only 45% with oral iron therapy. And at day 42, 100% patient had complete response rate, whereas only 60% patients responded with oral iron therapy. 
not only the complete response rate, but about partial response rate for also excellent with IV ferric carboxymaltose as compared to oral iron therapy at day 21 and day 42, about 100% with IV FCM at day 21 and day 42, whereas only 60 to 70% at day 22 and day 42 with oral iron therapy. Regarding the mean hemoglobin increase, you can see over here dramatic improvement with hemoglobin with IV FCM as compared to oral iron therapy. Not only this, the transplant saturation percentage, again, you can see dramatic increase in the transplant saturation percentage by giving IV FCM as compared to oral ferrous sulfate therapy in those patients who are suffering from acute GI bleed. So there was a big breaking news in the year 2018 that ferric carboxymaltose is the most effective therapy for GI-related iron deficiency anemia. What about pediatric patients who are suffering from inflammatory bowel disease? This original article was very, very fascinated to me the, on the journal Translation Pediatrics in the year 2019 published on ferric carboxymaltose and the treatment of iron deficiency in pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. And about 101 children with IBD suffering from IDA was enrolled. And the mean age was between 6 to 18 years of age with a middle age of 14 years from Queensland Children's Hospital in this band. And ferric carboxymaltose was given at a dose of 15 milligram per kg over 15 to 20 minutes. Max was 1000 milligram. 64% patient had resolution of anemia. About 81% patient had resolution of iron deficiency without anemia. Not only this, the high CRP levels had no influence in the resolution of iron deficiency anemia. And those patients who had got quashion disease activity had more likely resolution of iron deficiency. So it was well concluded. The rapid high dose of ferric carboxymaltose in children who are more than six years of age was very safe and well tolerated, as well as efficacious for correction of iron deficiency suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. Yet another research article regarding if effectiveness and safety of ferric carboxymaltose in children and adolescents with inflammatory bowel disease and other gastrointestinal disease, where about 72 children were enrolled, 40% were from Crohn's disease, 30% were suffering from ulcerative colitis. And what was seen that within five to 12 weeks of FCM therapy, ID got corrected from 9.5 grams of hemoglobin to 11.9 grams of hemoglobin. And not only the anemia got corrected, but the inflammatory markers like WBC, CRP, and platelets post FCM therapy also decreased. And hence FCM was considered as well tolerated and appeared to be very effective in corrective IDA in such patients. And not only this also led to decrease in the inflammatory markers. What about liver cirrhosis? and FCM therapy. This beautiful article, if you can read, efficacy and safety of treatment with ferric carboxymaltose in patients who are suffering with cirrhosis and gastrointestinal bleeding. About 34 patients who were enrolled with cirrhosis and who had GI bleed. Every patient were given 1000 milligram of FCM and there was a remarkable increase in hemoglobin in both IPD as well as OPD patients. IPD patients, the hemoglobin improved by the mean of three to 3.9. OPD patients, the hemoglobin include by the mean of 1.5 grams of hemoglobin. But there was no serious adverse events seen with any of these patients. And had, it was well concluded that ferric carboxymaltose administration achieved optimal serum hemoglobin levels in most cirrhotic patients with acute or chronic GI bleed, suggesting that an early FCM infusion improves and maintains the optimal serum hemoglobin levels in these patients and maybe appropriate first line therapy to treat their anemia. So take a message from my side regarding IV ferric carboxymaltose in GI disorders for suffering from Crohn's disease, suffering from ulcerative colitis, GI bleed, cirrhosis of liver, is that it's like a magic bullet. Why so? Because it's very effective with full rapidity of response, relatively free from any adverse events, no test dose required, and very important, no GI intolerance. Very easy to administer 15 minutes in single setting, hence recommended even for primary care setting, very cost effective, avoids the need of dangerous blood transmission and reduces the EPA requirement in patients who are suffering from GI disorders. And above all, a very, very excellent tolerable capacity and tolerance power with ferric carboxymaltose as compared to other IV agents. Well, thank you so much for the patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Amit, for that lovely talk. Uh, it was very important to emphasize so many aspects of this problem that you have emphasized. We'll come back to you during the QA session. I request you to hang on with us. We will complete the remaining four talks before we take up the QA session. So I'll just share my screen again to introduce Dr. Malikarjun Kalashetti, who is our next speaker. And uh, 
He is consultant hematologist, hemato-oncologist and bone marrow transplant physician in the Department of Hematology, Medical Oncology and Transplantation at the Comprehensive Cancer Center, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. He is also General Secretary of Karnataka Chapter of ISHBT. Formerly, he was consultant hematologist, hemato-oncologist and in charge of blood and bone marrow transplant unit at HCG MSR Cancer Center, Bangalore. Associate Professor M.S. Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore. He completed his MBBS and MD in Medicine from JN Medical College, Belgavi. Then he did DM in Clinical Hematology from the prestigious HGS Medical College in KM Hospital, Mumbai. During this, he was awarded gold medal. He completed one year of fellowship in bone marrow transplantation from Vancouver General Hospital, Vancouver, Canada. He has published many articles in hematology journals and has contributed chapters in hematology books. During last 10 years, he is a regular invitee to deliver guest lectures in various national conferences and workshops. Today, he is going to tell us the importance of IV FCM therapy for treating iron deficiency anemia during pregnancy. I'll stop here and hand over to him. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, all the viewers at the outset. I would like to thank uh, sir for the uh, for the opportunity and uh, wonderful lecture from Dr. Amit really uh, can't follow the suit. Uh, he killed it with the bullet uh, in the end. So there was time I was wondering whether it is Amit or Arnav from uh, from the TV. So I hope my, I'm audible and my slides are visible, sir. Yes. Yes. Oh, next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to talk about treating iron deficiency anemia and pregnancy with uh, IV ferric carboxymaltose. Uh, we have varied definitions of anemia and pregnancy, but it suffices to say any hemoglobin less than 10, 10.5 gram in women in, in any of the trimesters or postpartum period should be investigated and treated as anemia in this group has far reaching consequences, not for the mothers, but also for the fetal health uh, and, and their uh, future life. We have, uh, we have moved forward as a country. We are leaders in, 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 in ISRO, in space technology, in information technology. Soon we're going to be 5, billion, uh, 5 trillion economy rather, but then we continue to have uh, quite bad health indices and nothing worse than having uh, every alternate woman uh, having severe anemia in pregnancy. And if you see, it's not just uh, the, the significance and severity of anemia in these women. What is also very apparent is that uh, if, if women have pregnancy into a less than one year between the two pregnancies, both uh, the, the incidence and severity of anemia is much more compared to those women who have at least three years between the two pregnancies, which is extremely important for us to remember and help. Now, the iron requirement increased remarkably during pregnancy, and we know it is because of expansion of maternal red blood cell volume. We know it is also because of increased iron uh, need for fetal and placental circulation, and also the blood loss that happens during childbirth and postpartum period. So the average daily requirement of iron is around 0.8, but then it increased almost uh, you know, 10 times during pregnancy and more so in third trimester. Uh, and no matter how hard a woman tries, just the dietary iron will never be able to suffice the increased demand. So total iron requirement during a single-term pregnancy could be as much as 1,000 to 1,200 milligram. So uh, the, the, the incidence is so high that we, we, we practically have to screen all women in all gravidas for, for the iron deficiency, but much more so if women have had previous iron deficiency, are known to have diabetes, smoking or retroviral infection, have inflammatory bowel disease, as alluded to by Dr. Amit in the previous lecture, multiparous women, uh, women who had uh, history of abnormal uterine bleeding, obese and those who have strict vegetarians, it is much more common. And the iron deficiency has far-reaching consequences for both uh, the mother and the fetus. The antipartum complications could be increased risk of preterm delivery, premature rupture of membranes, preeclampsia, intrauterine death, increased risk of intercurrent infection, antipartal hemorrhage, and heart failure, rarely when the anemia is extremely severe. Fetal complications can be low birth weight and prematurity, more risk of infection, congenital malformations, neonatal anemia, and increased risk of transfusions. Cognitive impairment later in the life can also be related to severe iron deficiency in the pregnancy. So maternal anemia contributes to 18% of all perinatal mortality and 20% of maternal mortality in South Asian countries, including India. It is very simple to screen and diagnose iron deficiency. Most of us have been using serum ferritin level as a surrogate marker of tissue iron load, and any serum ferritin less than 30 nanogram is sufficient to confirm that one is iron deficient. 
Now, we all know that serum ferritin is also an acute phase reactant and that it can go up uh, even in iron deficient states if there is uh, inflammation. So in, in, in such situations, we also do serum ion studies and the transfer in saturation level less than 20% is indeed evidence of iron deficiency, regardless of ferritin level in such clinical situation. We all know that iron deficiency anemia evolves from iron deficient state without anemia. And if you were to look at the red cell indices, they too evolve from iron deficient state to iron deficiency anemia. So one can have iron deficiency without anemia, but then have low ferritin saturation. One can have iron deficiency with mild anemia, wherein the ferritin and transferrin saturation continues to go down. And by the time a patient develops severe iron deficiency with severe anemia, ferritin typically is, is below 10 nanogram per ml, and transferrin saturation is indeed less than 5 to 10%. So uh, treatment of iron deficiency, again, this is not a topic new to any of the audience here. So for, for a very long time, and even now, we continue to use oral iron, and it has its own advantage of being effective for most patients. It, it has extremely low risk of causing any serious adverse event, and costs are at least uh, seem to be lower. But then um, uh, the, GI uh, the GI toxicity is very high. Uh, patients will have dyspepsia, constipation, black stools, and most of them are not compliant for months of therapy that is needed. IV iron, on the contrary, is effective for most patients we know, and it leads to not only rapid correction of the tissue ion stores, but also improves anemia much robustly. And one can administer large doses of iron now with newer molecules in a single dose. Compliance is assured, and there are no GI toxicity with most of these. But then it does require close monitoring, and there are instances of rare allergic reaction. Some of those can be anaphylax and life-threatening, Hence, it needs equipment personnel to observe these patients during infusion. It is not, not safe to administer uh, IV iron at, ho at home, and it must be done in a hospital setup, and initial cost will be higher compared to oral iron. So um, we typically administer IV iron when we talk about IV iron pregnancy. If patients fail oral iron or they cannot tolerate oral iron and are poorly compliant, late or second trimester pregnancy with moderate to severe anemia where there is not enough time for the oral iron, Rapid rectification of iron and repletion of iron store is needed or expected. Individuals who have inflammatory bowel disease and bleeding diathesis when there is continued blood loss leading to severe iron deficiency. And IV iron is contraindicated or at least not used routinely in first trimester. So in pregnant women, we do not recommend administering intravenous iron in the first trimester. If there are no facilities for resuscitation, if patients can't be observed, it is not a good idea. If there's a known history of anaphylaxis uh, to parental iron, it must be avoided. And if the patient has iron overload, obviously no one uses it, right? So IVN therapy is superior to oral iron in terms of speed and observed extent of rise in hemoglobin and replenishment of iron stores, which is uh, confirmed. These are some of the recommendations uh, for the treatment of iron deficiency anemia in human. So if it is mild anemia, one can try oral iron. But again, so from dosing iron one to two times a day, I think all of us have moved to lower doses and perhaps at least on alternate day could be good enough. And if not only once a day is sufficient, I don't think one needs to give iron more frequently than once a day. If patients have severe anemia or are not compliant with oral iron, one will have to consider IV iron and we'll look at it a little more detail. Anyone who's severe anemia, I think, needs hospitalization, needs close monitoring and needs intravenous iron to improve the iron deficiency anemia. Again, so uh, it is not a new thing. IV iron has been there from the 1930s. When initially it was used, it was extremely toxic, we know. And to reduce the risk of anaphylax and other infusion reactions, what they did was try to have an iron core and carboxy uh, carbohydrate uh, shell. And various carbohydrate shells have used. So the rapid release of large amounts of labile-free iron was the one which was leading to toxicity and adverse drug reactions. Currently available new IV ions are non, uh, our carbohydrate complex are based on the spiroidal particles such that uh, the ion release in labile form is controlled and it mitigates the release of labile ion leading to lesser adverse reaction. So this allows administration of large doses of IV ion in a single dose and in a short time duration. So depending on how stable or strong that bond is, we divide them to type 1, type 2, type 3. Most of the newer IV ion molecules have type 1 strong, robust complex, leading to very slow release and much less labile iron circulation, hence lesser risk of complication and anaphylaxis. So if we were to look at the third generation IV iron, which is what we're talking about, pericarboxymaltose 
is something that is used in many patients with much less adverse toxicity. And if you look at the ideal IVRN, pericarboxymol dose kind of satisfies most of those features. And the important ones that I want to draw your attention to is time for injection. It only needs about 15 to 20 minutes. In fact, giving that over a longer duration of time might actually increase the risk of adverse events. And one can give 1,000 milligram in a single infusion, which is mighty helpful so that the number of times the patients and families need to visit hospital is much less. So uh, some of the limitations of old IV irons are IV dextran. They were always associated with uh, very high risk of serious allergic reactions. And it caused um, intramuscular injection is extremely painful. We don't use it uh, anymore at all. And iron sucrose was something that we we're using till very recently in pregnant women and young children. But we know that we can't use high doses and patients would have, have to come to the hospital multiple times. And it also had higher level of, of level iron. So, uh, Iron isomaldosite contains very high level of level iron among the third generation parent lions. And if you compare ferricarboxymol dose with all of this, we know that it has a robust and strong um, carbohydrate complex releasing iron gradually. And it also targets iron release to reticular endothelial system, thus minimizing level iron and reaction. And its neutral pH uh, does not release ionic iron at neutral pH, and hence therapeutically iron is available. And it has uh, it can be administered at higher doses in a short duration of time with good tolerance, and hence patients will, have, will need very fewer clinical visit and low toxicity and large safety margin is indeed possible with this. And if you look at the iron content, uh, rapid systemic uptake is ensured, and um, that is the reason why the FCM iron is rapidly utilized for heme synthesis and rapid correction of anemia and repletion of stores. And it has low immunogenicity, does not contain dextron or cross react with dextron antibodies. Hence, the risk of hypersensitive reactions or anaphylactic reactions are extremely low with ferricarboxymol dose, ensuring an excellent safety profile. And hence, we don't even use test dose in ferricarboxymol dose administration. So, if you were to look at and selecting um, the parent line, there are there is more than one reason for us to choose ferricarboxymol dose for high amount of iron in a single dose with very low risk of labile iron and hypersensitivity reactions associated with it. And advantages, safe option at a high dose of 1000 milligram. Uh, and um, if you see fewer clinical visits are necessary and near neutral pH and physiological osmolality, so low rate of injection site reactions. So overcomes most limitations of parent line of yester year. And hence it is something that we have been using uh, very often. So it has a robust complex with carbohydrate, not associated with dextran induced hypersensitivity, can be administered in much higher doses compared to other IV irons. Infusion time is about 15 to 20 minutes, which is very, very, uh, very, very effective. Iron is released slowly, avoiding toxicity and oxidative stress. Structure is similar to ferritin, hence uptake is, is preferred uh, preferentially in reticular endothelial cells. Test dose is not necessary and has very low immunogenic potential and that are best suited for real life clinical usage. And if you were to look at the level iron, the ferricarboxymaltose has one of the lowest level iron release in the serum. So uh, the dosage, again, there are various uh, formulas, but it is very simple. Most adults, if the hemoglobin is less than 10 gram, one needs to administer 1,500 to 2,000 milligram. And if the hemoglobin is more than 10 gram, a single dose of 1,000 milligram is sufficient in most adults. And how do we administer? Adverse reactions of ferricarboxymol dose are related to one, if you administer over longer prolonged infusion time, or if you dilute it too much. So in fact, concentration less than two milligram per ml are not permissible as it leads to uh, excess dilution, leads to destabilization of ion complex that may increase the risk of adverse effects. So one must be careful about dilution and the duration of infusion and hence reduce the risk of infusion reactions. So there are uh, there are global evidence of usage of ferricarboxymol dose in pregnancy, and there is large body of data proving both safety and efficacy in these patients. So current evidence highlighted the data of FCM usage in more than 5,000 patients, uh, pregnant women with hemoglobin rise as high as five gram per deciliter and very increase in the ferritin too. So few studies, efficacy and safety of ferricarboxymol dose in pregnant women with anemia, 
um, uh, Indian data and what it showed as what is expected. So in 1,800 patients, IVFCM resulted in significant rise in hemoglobin and also rise in ferritin. So adverse events are seen in about 7%, but most of those are mild adverse events like nausea, headache, diarrhea, constipation, and mild allergic reactions, and no serious adverse events were noted. So ferric carboxymod is in management of high interventional anemia and pregnancy. And again, this is an Indian study involving more than 1,000 patients. And what you see is that patients who are administered FCM in second or third trimester uh, with dosage ranging from 500 to 300 milligram. Again, there was an impressive rise in hemoglobin and serum ferritin, thus reversing anemia. So clinical effects and safety of ferric carboxymod in pregnancy, uh, real life experience, another Indian study. And what uh, we learned was Patients more than 270 when they were administered uh, IVN in second or third trimester, there was a significant rise in hemoglobin within 20 days, and it was more than four gram in most of these. So single large dose administration of FCM led to a rapid rise of hemoglobin in moderate to severe anemia during pregnancy in these Indian patients. Clinical effects and safety of uh, FCM in pregnancy again. And if you see all the vital parameters are within normal limit over the monitoring period of 45 minutes, none of the patient displayed any signs or symptoms of acute hypersensitivity reaction. Blood pressures were stable throughout and oxygenation was good too. So no clinically significant change in vital parameters during and immediately after FCM and absence of any hypersensitivity reactions correlates the safety and tolerability of FCM in treatment of iron deficiency anemia in pregnancy. How about the neonatal outcomes? And again, these have been showed by uh, multiple studies. So no adverse effects in terms of perinatal or neonatal outcomes were observed in newborns of women uh, who received FCM during pregnancy. And FCM and neonatal outcomes, global clinical evidence, if you see multiple studies, so neonatal outcomes, week of pregnancy, delivery, APGA score, birth weight, neonatal resuscitation and complications were not adversely affected due to ferric or maltose. So summarizing, Iron deficiency anemia is a common cause of significant maternal and fetal adverse outcomes. It is easy to diagnose with serum ferritin and serum ion studies. Oraline has high adverse gastrointestinal effects, much more so in pregnant women. Intravenous ion offers significant clinical benefits by reducing morbidity and mortality associated with iron deficiency both in mothers and fetal health. And intravenous ferric carboxymol dose is both safe and effective in treating iron deficiency anemia in pregnant women. So thank you, sir, and thank you all for patient hearing. I'll stop at that and hand over the podium back to Dr. M. B. Agrawal, sir. Thank you, Dr. Malik Arjun. This was another very, very important aspect of iron deficiency in its treatment because of the large number of young adult women who suffer from it. So please be with us for the QA session, and we will move on to the third speaker of the day. We have Dr. Gopinathan M. from Chennai. Uh, he is MD, DM in hematology, is Associate Consultant Hematologist at MGM Healthcare, Chennai. Uh, he did his MBBS from Government Chengalpattu Medical College, Tamil Nadu, followed by MD in Pediatrics from Jipmer, Puducherry. He was Senior Resident in Pediatric and Medical Oncology at Jipmer for one year each. Subsequently, he did the DM clinical hematology training from SGPGI Lucknow, and he passed his DM with gold medal. As a research project, he standardized LCMS technique for monitoring therapeutic levels of methotrexate during the high-dose methotrexate therapy in childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia. His clinical interests are in bone marrow failure syndromes, thalassemia, HLH, and bone marrow transplantation. Publications in infantile cholestasis, HLH, AML induction toxicities, and GI manifestations in hematolymphoid malignancies. As mentioned, he was gold medalist both at the UG and University First in the DM exams. I request him to speak on a, a bit difficult subject of treating anemia of systemic disease using IVFCM. So I'll stop here and request him to take over. Thank you very much, sir, for the opportunity and nice introduction. Uh, good morning, respected colleagues and uh, seniors. I'm sharing, sharing my screen. So, is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Can you make it slideshow more?
maybe you can uh, stop sharing and again share it. Okay. Yeah. Proper. Yeah. Thank you. So for the next few minutes, we'll be uh, discussing about treating anemia of systemic disease with Perez Carboximantos. So I'd like to break down the topic under the following ethics, a small introduction, global burden of anemia and systemic disease, and what are the various systemic diseases we see, and what is the basic pathophysiology happening there, that is iron deficient erythropoiesis, and why to treat it, and what is the efficacy of oral versus parenteral iron, and how is it efficacious, and what are the various effects that can happen, in a small conclusion. So as we all know, WHO defines anemia as hemoglobin below 13 grams per deciliter in males and 12 grams per deciliter in females, with pregnancy a slightly lower cutoff of 11 grams and age-defined cutoff in children. The global burden of anemia is estimated as high as 1.9 million. This is according to the 2019 statistics, where again we could find nutritional as a most common cause of anemia, and then followed by systemic causes, which includes hemolytic anemias and all the other systemic diseases which can have anemia as one of the manifestations. The peculiarity about anemia in systemic diseases is there is a coexisting iron deficient anemia as well as anemia of inflammation overlap in all these systemic diseases. So when the patients present to us, they can have fatigue, dizziness, cognitive impairment, which could be in, attributed both to the anemia as well as to the primary disease that they have. And it's quite important to differentiate between these two. And they can have functional impairment of organ system and organ functions because of anemia and ultimately leading to poor quality of life. So this was the recent statistics that was available with this. So, so we, you can see the horizontal bar diagram, stratified bar diagram, where you could see the orange color and the blue color graph represent nutritional as well as the hemolytic causes of anemia. And significantly, the other uh, color codings represents the anemia in systemic diseases. It's almost one third, you could see the anemia in systemic diseases is represented almost one third across all the uh, countries across the globe. So this is again the age-wise distribution of causes of anemia uh, across various countries where you could see uh, predominantly in the younger age group, the, new, the graph is proportionately high out of nutritional cause. Whereas in the younger age group, that is between 30 to 40, the nutritional cause goes a bit slightly down and the proportion of anemia due to systemic diseases is slightly taking up a higher end. So why anemia, why iron is much talked about in systemic disease? As we understand, yes, iron plays an important role in erythropoiesis, maintaining the hemoglobin, maintaining the circulation perfusion. But iron also has its role in other organs. Say, for example, in the nervous system, it is an important cofactor in various neurometabolic enzymes that is important for us in formulating excitatory neurotransmitters. And then organs which are rich in mitochondria like kidney, heart, skeletal muscle, these are organs which are uh, highly, uh, highly metabolically active. They take a high amount of oxidative phosphorylation and this is possible only because of its iron sulfur proteins. So basically, if iron forms this iron sulfur proteins and because of this iron sulfur protein, the oxidative phosphorylation is able to happen smoothly. And apart from that, beta oxidation of fatty acids again takes place in the mitochondria, which again needs iron. And also it has some scavenging action or scavenging action. And not only with the oxidative metabolism, it plays an important role in production of thyroid hormones. It again has its immune effective functions by ways of lactoferrin and various other cytokines. And also it plays an important role in cell cycle and repair. So as pediatricians, physicians, and uh, hematologists, we see across various diseases. The list is quite exhaustive, but these are few to put up. So we commonly come across infectious diseases, autoimmune diseases, CKD, CLD, CHD, CLDs, and neurological disorders, various endocrine disorders. And nowadays with the advent of all solid organ transplants, we see an extended life spectrum of patients and the most common referral that we get at any point of time to a hematologist is anemia. Now, understanding the disease dynamics of this, all these diseases is quite important because we can have patient presenting very sick to us in the emergency like this, whereas the same patient can walk comfortably to an outpatient clinic like this. Both of them can have anemia. Understanding the disease dynamics at this point of time and the iron uh, metabolism at this point of time is important because the way, the rapidity that we need to correct anemia subsequent, uh, substantially differs between the two patient groups. So as we see, anemia and systemic diseases is always multifactorial. 
So to understand, we can put up them into two factors. That is a hypoferemic factors and normo or hyperferemic factors. So under hypoferemic factors, so these patients have repeated hospital visits. They have poor appetite. They have they are subjected to repeated blood draws and examinations. As a result of which, they have iron loss. And not only that, before because of poor appetite, they can have other micronutrient deficiencies as well, like B12, folate, and all other trace elements. And they will be on multiple drugs. They will have drug-induced gastritis, ulcers. They can be using some blood, uh, blood constantly from the gut. Coming to the normal or hyperferemic factors, they have high degree of inflammation. They have a high degree of, I mean, high levels of epsidin. And they have enhanced RBC lysis and a shorter RBC lifespan due to the underlying inflammation. And some toxic metabolites in uremia, say, for example, indo indoximethylsulfate, uh, all these can decrease erythrocyte production. And not only underproduction of uh, erythrocyte due to underproduction of erythropoietin, there can be erythropoietin hyporesponsiveness and there can be poor hypoxic sensing that can happen in these systemic disorders, which ultimately all of these factors attrib are attributed for the uh, uh, causative of anemia in systemic disease. So if we take the underlying pathophysiology at the cellular level, to understand iron deficiency anemia is quite simple, where there is deficiency either by intake or by absorption. There is a decrease of bioavailable iron, and ultimately the marrow is not able to produce uh, hemoglobin. Whereas in anemia of systemic disease, there is availability of iron still, but it, it is not able to be incorporated into the nanetron. So if we take this sequence from A, B, C, D, in anemia where, I mean, in uh, systemic diseases where due to infections or due to underlying inflammation, there are this particular molecular patterns, PAMPs and DAMs, which trigger the immune effector cells to produce inflammatory cytokines. These inflammatory cytokines transduce hepcidin. And as we all know, this hepcidin is a important, uh, plays an important role in blockaging this ferroportin. Ferroportin plays important roles at two sides. One is at the absorption side, it helps us to take, us, take the iron from the intestinal epithelial to, uh, cell into the bloodstream, as well as in the macrophages, it tries to release the sequestered iron between the and the macrophages. So when the hepcidin levels are high, these ferroportin is blocked as well. As, uh, so that is the basic reason why the functional iron is not coming into the bloodstream. So as a result of which we don't, we have decreased iron binding to the transferrin complex in the plasma, and thereby decreased availability of iron to the bone, I mean bone marrow erythroblasts. So thereby we have the deficient iron deficient erythropoiesis. So as physicians, we need to try to differentiate between the anemia, iron deficiency anemia and anemia of chronic inflammation overlap. So this is just a simplified algorithm. So we basically start with hemoglobin. We basically start with red blood cell indices and reticulocyte production index. If the MCV is low and if the reticulocyte production index is less than two, then we straight away diversify the algorithm according to the MCV. If the MCV is low, and MCH is slow, and the ferritin and the transferrin saturation is low, the diagnosis is quite straightforward. We come back to iron deficiency anemia. Whereas if the red blood cell indices are normal, and the ferritin is more than 200, then it is falling towards the anemia of inflammation. Whereas in between these two is the or, uh, region of or gray zone, where we have the region of overlap between microcyte, I mean, iron deficiency anemia, as well as anemia of inflammation for which we look at these parameters to clarify the exact iron dynamics that is happening to the patient. So in iron deficiency anemia, as we all know, red cell distribution width is increased, percentage of hypochromic carbases will be more than 10%, whereas in anemia of inflammation, it can be normal and it is quite low. Coming to the biochemistry, in iron deficiency anemia, we know that the ferritin is low, whereas in anemia of inflammation, it is normal to increased. Iron will be low in both. Transferrin saturation will be low in both, whereas to specifically discriminate between IDA and anemia of inflammation, we have the serum soluble free transferrin receptor, which is quite increased in iron deficiency anemia, whereas it is normal in anemia of chronic disease. The soluble free transferrin receptor is nothing but the uh, uh, truncated form of transferrin receptor that is present over the erythroblast. And not only SFTR, when we make a ratio of SF soluble free transferrin receptor to the log ferritin, we have, it is increased, it is more than two in NIDA and deficiency anemia, whereas it is less than one in anemia of inflammation. And to discriminate anemia of inflammation, we can have elevated cytokines, we can have increased cyto, uh, increased epsilon, and we can have increased inflammatory markers. In iron deficiency anemia, EPO levels can be normal to high, whereas in anemia of chronic disease, EPO is low. 
So when coming to the management of anemia of chronic disease, anemia of systemic disease, we have these three tools to manage them. So one is iron, which can be in parental as well as oral form, and second is erythropoietin, and third is blood transfusion. So we are not going to talk about the last uh, uh, two modalities of treatment. We are going to concentrate only on the iron therapy. So why maintain a normal ferimic erythropoiesis is because when we have low anemia, we can have patients can have poor cognitive dysfunction, patients can have decreased muscular endurance, patients can have in prolonged myopathy, patients can have prolonged CCF. They have, as a result of all of which, they can have prolonged hospitalization and there is increased mortality that has been reported in CKD patients due to anemia. Whereas we have to balance out, like when having an iron at an increased level, that is always a chance of infection risk due to sidrophilic organisms and there is increased oxidative stress. So why parental iron, why over oral iron is because of the simple reasons oral iron uh, is, has a very limited absorption and particularly in the setting of inflammation, they will have very, very uh, uh, low grade of absorption and we need repeated dosing and it has an adverse uh, GI effect profile like they may have some uh, nausea, vomiting, they may have some gut uh, intolerance because of which they may have a low adherence. Whereas coming to the parental iron, they are quite faster. We are able to achieve an increased hemoglobin level in a very short span of time. And it is effective even in the presence of inflammation. And it never has any GI side effects. And with the advent of this um, modern um, in, uh, techniques, which with ferrous carboxymaltose one gram, where a higher dose can be delivered in a short span of time. Whereas drawbacks, it just requires a medical expertise. It needs to be cash cautiously administered in a hospital setting. And coming to the parent line, we have this evolution of parental lion that has been uh, happening from the early 90s. So come starting from iron dextran, iron sucrose, we have evolved now to iron carboxymaltose and isomaltose. Of which iron carboxymaltose is the ideal molecule. Why? Because it has an ideal molecular weight. It has a good complex, high complex stability, quite extended half-life and the near neutral pH. And it is isotonic with a very low antigenicity. And the main advantage is a short for a short duration, a very high dose can be de delivered. So this is just the basic structure of ferrous carboxymaltose where the iron core is inside, which is surrounded by a carboxymaltose shell. It is a very stable complex and it is formulated as a colloidal solution with an ideal physiological, palette, uh, physiological pH. And due to the stability of the complex, it does not release uh, ionic iron under physiological conditions. So, uh, and the percentage of label iron that is present in ferrous carboxymaltose, it's very, very low compared to the other iron preparations, which makes it, all of these makes it ideal. So coming to the administration, we commonly use this uh, Anthony's formula, which is just weight into ideal HB minus actual HB into 2.4 plus 500. So that we usually keep the target as 15, whereas for weight less than 35 kg, we can use 13 as a target. But to understand it very simple and short, this is the, just the gross uh, uh, calculation of how we deliver iron in appropriate dosages between hemogram less than 10 grams and more than 10 grams, between weights 35 to 70, more than 70 kg. So now coming to its efficacy, how it is all helping in, in various systemic diseases. This is once a such study conducted among the patients with heart failure. So the most common study that has been talked about is a FAR HF trial where Infusion of ferrous carboxymaltose has uh, improved subjective improvement of patient felt symptoms and NIHA functional class, as well as six minute walk test and the visual analog screen. So, all of uh, after I mean, after administration of ferrous carboxymaltose, a symptomatic benefit is observed in all these parameters. And not only the FAR HF trial, even the Comfort HF trial and the Effect HF trial all have proved benefit of using ferrous carboxymaltose. This is one other study in uh, CK use, use of CK use of ferrous carboxymaltose in CK. It is quite a large center study involving almost 450 patients where use of uh, rather than the use of oral iron, infusion of ferrous carboxymaltose has provided a significant increase in hemoglobin when these patients are assessed over the long term follow up. And not only the use, we also, I mean, not only in the CKD, we can use this ferrous, IV ferrous carboxymaltose and various other systemic disorders like endocrine disorders, rheumatological disorders, just to achieve a faster rise in hemoglobin. And not only this, not only the advantages, we should always have 
adverse effects at the uh, back of the mind. They, they can have minor infusion related reaction. They can have minor injection site reactions. They can have mild taste alterations, hypophosphatemia and dizziness, which is very, very less in the modern uh, FCM preparations compared to the older iron preparations. So to conclude, early identification of anemia and its etiology is necessary to ensure optimal tissue oxygenation. Iron correction needs to be individualized for the patient and disease. Newer parameters help to uh, discriminate iron deficiency anemia and anemia of inflammation to some extent. So for iron, the anemia of inflammation, drugs targeting hepcidin, BMP SPAD pathway and hypoxia inducible factor pathways pave off for the treatment in future. So with this, I conclude. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Gopinathan, for making a very complex subject so easy to understand. It's very clear why you have been getting gold medals after gold medals. Not only you have the knowledge, you have the power of expression and making the things so simple. Thank you for participating in this webinar and be with us for the question and answer session. I will now introduce the next speaker. We have Dr. Ganesh Jayshetwar from Hyderabad. Uh, he is well known to everybody, it's just the formality. He's MD. DM Clinical Hematology, Postdoctoral Fellowship in Bone Marrow Transplantation from Tata Medical Center, Fellowship in Leukemia and Bone Marrow Transplantation from UBC Canada, Lead Consultant Hematologist and Head, Hemato Oncologist and BMT Physician at Yashoda Hospitals, High Tech City, Hyderabad, with over 20 years of experience. He has accomplished over 250 bone marrow transplants performed independently at his center. He completed MBBS from Nagpur University, 2001. MD Pathology from University of Mumbai, University of Mumbai, 2006. DM Clinical Hematology from the West Bengal University of Health Sciences, Calcutta, 2011. He is a member of ASH, American Society of Bone Marrow Transplantation, and American College of Physicians. He's going to lecture on treating cancer-related anemia using IVFCM. Over to him. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the kind introduction and this wonderful opportunity. Uh, is my slides visible I'm, uh, and I'm, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah. So. Thank you for this opportunity, sir. It has been a wonderful session. And for a hematologist, it's like, you know, every day, day to day practice, IV iron is an essential component of uh, uh, most of the patient's uh, uh, management plan. So, uh, again, when I was preparing for this top topic, you know, again, thanks to MB Agrawal, sir, he always brings all the new concept in the subject, uh, which we are not aware of. And this uh, IV iron in cancer was also a subject very. Uh, uh, I was not familiar with, but I'm sure with the literature evolving, I had gone through, I will try to, you know, convince all of you how useful it is and, you know, the future of uh, uh, anemia related to the cancer uh, uh, management. It revolves around uh, IVR and more than the erythropoietin, which we are firmly believing with. So, uh, we all know that the outline of my talk is uh, going to be, I will uh, briefly describe the incidence of uh, iron deficiency, uh, um, anemia in cancer, various cancers. The etiopathology of uh, uh, iron deficiency, anemia in uh, cancers, both solids and hematological malignancies. So basically it evolves around both functional as well as absolute iron deficiency. And many of my previous speakers have nicely elaborated the role of hepcidin and how this hepcidin uh, and its uh, you know its various strategies to block hepcidin how they are coming up in the management of uh, anemia related to cancer then the role of ivr in cancer the various clinical trials and at the end i will uh, try to highlight emphasize some of the guidelines focusing on uh, emphasizing the role of ivr in uh, in the various cancer settings. So we, as my previous speaker has highlighted, till uh, now we were believing that anemia of systemic inflammation or systemic diseases like uh, heart failure, CKD, IBD, uh, we knew that IV iron is absolutely a useful uh, uh, molecule. But uh, in the cancer setting also, you can see 
the incidence of iron deficiency anemia is close to 32 to 60 percent. So, evolving role of anemia iron deficiency across not just various systemic disorders, but also cancers. And this is another paper from uh, North America, the prevalence of iron deficiency as well as uh, absolute anemia across various cancer. And you can see the blue bars are iron deficiency. The red bars are the uh, anemia. So you can see iron deficiency is prevalent across all solid as well as hematological malignancies. In fact, the incidence of iron deficiency, either absolute or functional, is even more than the uh, incidence of anemia across the various uh, cancers. So uh, with this, just I will briefly elaborate iron metabolism on the concept of uh, absolute versus uh, functional iron deficiency. So um, as we all know, the absorption of uh, iron from the duodenum is a minor proportion, one to two milligram per day. But the major proportion of iron for these building RBCs come from the iron recycled from the reticular endothelial system, which is amounts to about 30 mg. And this is various, you know, iron present in various uh, 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 components. Uh, majority is hemoglobin. Two third of body's iron is, is in hemoglobin. So, uh, and then if we think of the overall iron metabolism and iron homeostasis, it's very easy to categorize those into functional and storage component. Functional is majority of which uh, hemoglobin uh, containing iron is about 65%, whereas storage is 20%. So in nutshell, males have four to five gram of iron versus females 3.5 to, 3 to 4 gram of iron, uh, total body iron. So. Uh, with regard to iron metabolism, there are two key proteins we should aware of. One is transferrin, which transports iron in the blood, and ferritin is a, which is a long-term storage side of uh, uh, site of iron. So this is how a transferrin, which you can at any time bind two iron molecules, and ferritin can uh, store up to. 3000 iron uh, uh, molecules. So this, how does the iron gets to the RBC? My previous speakers have elaborated this, but to understand functional iron deficiency, this is very, very important. So from gut to transferrin receptor via transferrin and then uh, subsequently into the, uh, uh, the developing RBCs, whereas from the storage sites, mostly liver and macrophages, uh, which stores ferritin via ferroportin. So this, uh, you know, goes through the, uh, this uh, ferroportin, you can see the transferrin cycle from the blood into the developing RBCs by again DMT1 molecule, whereas from the iron, from the majority iron, which is supplied to the developing RBCs, uh, about 30 milligram per day is from the storage sites. And this again uh, uh, exported through ferroportin. And when we think of anemia of cancer, these are the broad, you know, this case describes the overall uh, 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 etiopathogenesis of iron deficiency anemia in cancer. You can see this can be due to blood loss like surgery, coagulopathy, GI malignancies, uh, everyday uh, blood drawing, or this can be due to various nutritional deficiencies which are quite rampant in uh, cancer-related patients. Uh, this absolute leads to absolute iron deficiency, whereas the cancer uh, milieu is immunoinflammatory and that uh, by various cytokines, it uh, upregulates hepcidin and then hepcidin leads to uh, blockage of iron from, from the storage as well as the absorption site leading to functional iron deficiency. So uh, the various etiologies of cancer-related anemia is uh, by this immuno-inflammatory uh, process. The cancer treatment itself, uh, many drugs are myelosuppressive, can suppress the marrow and suppress the erythropoiesis, occult blood loss, nutritional deficiencies, and the inflammatory comorbidities. So this is br broadly the three uh, subcategories, the chemotherapy-related anemia, anemia secondary to cancer because of either absolute or uh, uh, functional iron deficiency, and uh, kidney involvement. So again, this sketch uh, nicely elaborates the same thing. The tumor uh, inflammatory milieu leads to various cytokines, upregulating hepcidin, and this hepcidin uh, by blocking the release of iron for developing RPCs lead to functional iron deficiency. And one of the surrogate markers, uh, uh, even though hepcidin is not available commercially for, as a monitoring tool, but CRP can be used as a surrogate marker of this inflammatory immunobiology of cancer-related anemia. So anemia of systemic disease, uh, Dr. Gopinathan has nicely elaborated. So apart from various other disorders, cancer-related anemias also uh, can be e uh, thought of in the similar analogy. So again, hepcidin, uh, this cartoon blocking the uh, 
the release of iron from the storage sites, mostly macrophages and liver, and reducing iron absorption. So uh, this is again nicely elaborated in this cartoon, blocks intestinal absorption, again by ferroportin, and the same ferroportin blocks export from the macrophages and hepatocytes, leading to absolute, uh, leading to uh, uh, deficient iron for developing RBCs. So uh, this is how the implication of hepcidin in uh, functional iron deficiency. Um, this uh, the hepcidin uh, leads to decreased intestinal absorption, increased sequestration in the sore ties. This leads to decreased available iron for uh, RBC development, decreased iron delivery to the red cells, and can lead to both absolute as well as functional iron deficiency. So again. The same uh, thing uh, depicted in this cartoon storage pool blocking the uh, transfer in uh, uh, bound iron release to the uh, developing RBCs. Again, this is nicely elaborated by Dr. Gopinathan. So basically, the difference between the uh, absolute iron deficiency versus functional iron deficiency. So uh, in absolute iron deficiency, the transfer in saturations are less than 20% and ferritin is low. Whereas in functional iron deficiency, even though the storage iron ferritin is high, it can be as high as up to 800, but the transfer in saturation below 20% is characteristics. But in the uh, context of iron deficiency related to functional iron deficiency related to cancer, uh, the transfer in saturation up to 50 can be considered as functional iron deficiency. So the two important tools for monitoring hemoglobin, ferritin, and transfer in saturation. And this is again, absolute versus functional iron deficiency. You can see the absolute iron deficiency when the transfer in saturation is less than 20% and ferritin is less than 30. Whereas when the ferritin up to 500 and transfer in less than 20% uh, is classical functional iron deficiency, transfer in saturation up to 50 and uh, ferritin up to 500 again can be a possible functional iron deficiency. Uh, and ferritin up to uh, uh, 800 with transfer in saturation less than 20%. Again, it is a possible functional iron deficiency. So this was a new learning for me. So ferritin up to 800, transfer in saturation less than 50% can be considered in context of cancer-related anemia as functional iron deficiency. And iron injections are absolutely indicated under these circumstances, which I will elaborate through various uh, guidelines. So again, um, uh, uh, the hepcidin is at the center of all the etiopathogenesis of anemia of systemic diseases, including anemia of cancer. And this is again, iron deficiency, erythropoiesis versus iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency is the disease. It may, or it may happen with or without anemia. Uh, uh, so, because hemoglobin is last compromise. So, anemia in cancer can be cancer related anemia, as I elaborated here, but it can also be chemotherapy induced anemia, about 67% prevalence among cancer patients, whereas absolute uh, 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 the, our functional iron deficiency, 30 to 60%. So, changing gears further, the incidence, the role of uh, uh, evidence of IV iron in cancer related anemia. Again, how does IV iron work? Uh, in this uh, functional as well as absolute iron deficiency. So IV iron immediately saturates the circulating transferrin, uh, when, uh, which then brings the iron wire transferrin receptor to the surface, surface of developing erythroblast. At the same time, this super saturation of IV iron in the macrophages, uh, this leads to uh, uh, loading of iron in the uh, ma macrophages, which upregulates this IRP1 and 2 and subsequently ferroportin thereby overcoming the hepcidin block. So uh, uh, high doses of IV iron uh, in functional iron deficiency can overcome the uh, negative regulation by hepcidin in the development of uh, uh, erythropoiesis, uh, uh, iron deficiency erythropoiesis. So we need to think differently. And as the, we were knowing the rise and fall of erythropoietin, so uh, 10 years back, erythropoietin was absolutely indicated for all cancer-related anemias. But the subsequent studies have shown that uh, the this is the uh, uh, one of the landmark studies, the high, uh, uh, the, the high EPH B4 uh, and patients exposed to erythro erythropoietin simulating agents, you can see their survival is significantly lower. So which high, uh, chances of disease progression uh, and high chances of uh, uh, long-term inferior survival. Erythropoietin should be used cautiously, uh, particularly when the intent of uh, treatment for these cancers is curative. So adequate iron is absolutely required for uh, 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 iron sup supply in these cancer-related anemias to decrease the hospitalizations, to decrease the transfusion burden. 
So these two important parameters, ferritin and transferrin saturation should be done at baseline and should be monitored periodically if the patient, uh, depending upon the patient's response, uh, hemoglobin response to either uh, iron alone or iron plus erythropoietin. So again, uh, the ferric carboxymaltose, there have been many studies, specific benefits of uh, FCM. So with FCM, with single dose, it is safe, highly tolerable. It overcomes the functional iron deficiency characteristic of cancer-related inf inflammation. And this circumvents functional iron block by overcoming the effects of increased hepcidin level. And at the same time, it also increases the GI absorption of available iron, thereby uh, leading to uh, more efficient erythropoiesis. And again, you can see the, the dose effect on the long-term hemoglobin improvement. You can see dose more than 1,000 milligrams have much uh, better hemoglobin recovery on a uh, four-week uh, uh, time point in these cancer-related animals. So FCM is taken up by reticuloendothelial system in no time. In, after that, the iron is delivered to iron bonding proteins, ferritin transferrin, and this is this overcomes the uh, the block from the and this is very safe because the labile or NTBI non-transferrin by iron with the FCN is very very low. This is because of the uh, the carbohydrate shell. And one important point here: the carbohydrate shell used for preparation of FCM is. Uh, is uh, 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 is the one which is which was previously used to prevent the uh, or treat the uh, uh, dextran associated anaphylactic reaction so the reactions anaphylaxis or uh, other reactions with this kind of carbohydrate shell is extremely rare and the uh, labile uh, iron release with the fcm is extremely low so the hype or hypersensitivity the uh, the hype of hypersensitivity is uh, just a practical a theoretical fear practically most of the patients end up with uh, quite safe and efficient administration. So uh, this is my last part, the IV iron in cancer, the clinical trial evidence. This is a, uh, there are many meta-analyses. So I, uh, clinical trials of IV iron with erythropoietin uh, stimulating agents, erythropoietin uh, uh, combinations in cancer-induced anemia. You can see in all these trials uh, spanning between uh, 2004 to 2013, there has been significant improvement in the hemoglobin and decrease in the transfusion burden. Again, this is uh, uh, IVRN as a monotherapy, also equally efficacious in the cancer-related anemias across various cancer settings. So again, this is one of the recent publications. The transfusion requirement, you can see the yellow bar is IVRN and the uh, uh, blue bar is uh, uh, the control arm. You can see the transfusion requirement is less than 50% in IV arm, arm and HB response is much superior in the IV iron arm. So this is a meta-analysis of IV iron in cancer. You can see the, uh, the this forest plot, the meta-analysis of almost 16 trials over the last two decades favors IV iron uh, for the management of uh, cancer-related anemia. Again, uh, IV iron plus uh, erythropoietin, again, this forest plot, another meta-analysis favors combination versus erythropoietin alone. So just a few guidelines. What is the evidence uh, uh, based on the various guidelines? So ASH and ASCO guidelines, this is recently published 2018. So they reviewed 15 meta-analysis and two randomized controlled trials. And what the totality of evidence suggests that adding iron supplementation to erythropoietin therapy improves hematopoietic response and reduces the likelihood of, likelihood of uh, RBC transfusions. So the consensus recommendation is iron replacement may be used to improve hemoglobin response and reduce transfusions for patients receiving erythropoietin with or without iron deficiency. In fact, erythropoietin should be offered to patients with chemotherapy-induced anemia whose treatment is not for curative intent and where hemoglobin is less than 10 gram. So with notable exceptions like MDS, erythropoietin should not be offered to cancer patients where the anemia is not chemotherapy related and where the intention of treatment is curative. So this is again NCCN guidelines. You can see the, so the summary is same, transferrin saturation up to 50% and ferritin less than 800, there is a role of IV iron. So ESMO guidelines, so who should receive IV FCM? Patient receiving chemotherapy with uh, hemoglobin less than 11 grams or more than two gram drop from the baseline of uh, 12 grams or absolute iron deficiency by uh, the various parameters. Uh, and if ESA therapy is employed, iron supplementation should be given before and or during ESA treatment in case of functional iron deficiency, that is transferrin saturation up to 50 and ferritin up to 800. So should patients receive IVFCM without concomitant ESA? 
So IVFCM monotherapy uh, may be considered for patients with functional iron deficiency. And what is the appropriate dosing of IV iron for functional iron deficiency? FCM 1K, whereas absolute iron deficiency, uh, depending upon the uh, the parameters. So this is the algorithm published in How I Treat Cancer Related Anemia. Again, in the nutshell, ferritin up to 500, transfer saturation up to 50, possible functional iron deficiency, IV iron challenge, potentially useful, whereas ferritin up to 800 and transfer in saturation less than 20%, possible functional iron deficiency, again, IV iron challenge, potentially useful. So this is the last slide uh, before conclusion. So apart from IV iron, there are a lot of new drugs coming up in the management of cancer-related anemia. Notable of them are hepcidin antagonists like luspartacept and PSD inhibitors. So we need, definitely need to change our approach in management of cancer-related anemia, including hematopoietic malignancies uh, uh, like leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma. So to conclude, uh, uh, cancer-related anemia and chemotherapy-induced anemia both revolves around inflammatory nature uh, uh, mediated by hepcidin, just like anemia of inflammation or anemia of chronic disease. Pathobiology is largely governed by hepcidin, which gives rise to functional iron deficiency. And these systemic reviews and meta-analysis of late over last one decade uh, has shown that IV iron to be particularly useful in both cancer-related anemia as well as chemotherapy-induced anemia by improving the hematopoietic response rate, reducing the transfusion burden, and benefits demonstrated both as a combination IV iron therapy or uh, in combination with erythropoietin. So, and IV iron is endorsed by various guidelines like ASH, ASCO, NCC, and ESMO, as I highlighted in cancer-related anemia and chemotherapy-induced anemia. So with that, uh, I would like to stop here. Thank you so much for this opportunity once again, sir, and over to you. Uh, thank you, Ganesh, for once again uh, putting across, and I hope there are a lot of oncologists listening to you, the use of blood will be reduced and patients will benefit from IV ion therapy with or without erythropoietin. Thanks for bringing this so clearly. We go to the last speaker. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Amita Mahajan. Once again, she requires no introduction. She's senior consultant, pediatric hematology and oncology at Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, Delhi. She's executive member, INPHOG, Indian Pediatric Hematology Oncology Group. She's chairperson for the Hodgkin Lymphoma Subcommittee. And she's secretary for the Teenage and Young Adult Cancer Foundation. And she's going to speak to us on treating pediatric iron deficiency anemia, ironing out the issues. So over to you, Dr. Amita. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Agarwal. Am I audible? Yes. I'll just share my... Are my slides visible, sir? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, it's been really a pleasure to listen to all the speakers uh, because as a pediatric hematologist, our personal experience with uh, IV ferric my, uh, carboxymaltose is actually relatively limited. And that's why I've chosen the topic uh, slightly differently because iron deficiency anemia is the number one clinical problem in children, regardless of what other condition they may or may not have. But the role or the precise place of IVFCM is currently still being established. Uh, all my previous speakers have highlighted, but I think um, even I can have you put one slide on this, that worldwide at any given moment, more individuals have iron deficiency anemia than any other health problem. And really 2 billion people, which is over 30% of the world's population is anemic you know, currently primarily due to iron deficiency. In India and specifically in children, the etiology is nutritional deficit, worm infestation, malaria. I mean, this is, this is what our problem is. Iron deficiency affects more people than any other condition constituting really a public health epidemic, and it exerts the heaviest overall toll in terms of ill health, premature death, and lost earnings. India has the dubious distinction of having the most anemic women and children. I mean, we are anyway the largest, populous, most populous country in the world, and so it's no surprise that we lead the world in, in this specific problem. 
Unfortunately, despite relentless efforts by governments and the medical community, this does not seem to be improving. If you see this, this is the National Family Health Survey and the recent survey in 2019 to 21, which was compared with the survey done five years before, actually shows that the prevalence of anemia, and most of it is iron deficiency anemia, has actually increased in this age group despite all the efforts. So it, it is so such a big uh, flesh, you know, thorn in the flesh of the Indian government because this is the only healthcare index that is not shifting. That the government has actually explored asking the pediatric medical community whether we would consider changing the definition of anemia because we are somehow not being able to win this battle at all. The predominant cause is actually prolonged milk based feeding in children and, you know, lack of iron content in the you know, Indian vegetarian diet, which most of us consume. So it's not that survey is limited to six months and five years, but even as early as three months, three, this study was done between three to five months, a quarter to one third of the children are already iron deficient by the time they reach this point. We, you know, all the previous speakers have highlighted the negative impact on multiple systems, but this effect is most dire in young children. And the irreparable damage that iron deficiency in childhood can cause on one hand and the knowledge and mechanism, I mean, it's so easy to treat comparatively, you know, compared to adults, it really makes this silent morbidity completely unacceptable in modern times. So current guidelines actually say that children should be actively screened for iron deficiency anemia. And the Indian Academy of Pediatric Guideline is that this should be done at around nine months because we do expect that a very large proportion of children will be uh, anemic at this point. So what are the recommendations? What the recommendation is that really every child needs to be on iron supplementation because Indian diet does not meet the recommended dietary allowance. For breastfed infants, it's just one milligram per kg per day of oral iron from about four to six months of age. But for preterm infants, because in, intra, in utero transfer of iron happens in the last trimester, so preterm infants are very vulnerable to iron deficiency and supplementation in them should start at two weeks. The government has had this initiative, National Iron Plus Initiative, uh, for last so many years, wherein six, all children six months to 19 years should actually receive some form of iron supplementation. And it's usually, be, it's recommended for about 100 days in a month. It was recommended so that it could be given by the Anganwadi, uh, in the Anganwadis and in school. Um, and as you can see, every child deserves, you know, needs to be on iron supplementation. So if we've had this program for over a decade now, why has it not translated into anything? Because it is the recent, a recent ICMR study showed that at the ground level, only 1% of this delivery actually happened. So even though very well-intentioned, very scientific, um, you know, there was a whole plan laid out, but it hasn't really panned out the way it was intended. So for very recently, these are from last year, the current treatment guidelines for iron deficiency in pediatric anemia have been summarized uh, in this document, as well as in this much more detailed document that covers both iron deficiency and megaloblastic anemia with clear guidelines on how to diagnose and manage. So when we talk for children, treatment is largely continues to be with oral iron. One, because uh, it's just easier. Two, you know, the GI intolerance issue sometimes, somehow does not seem to be as big an issue for children as it is for adults. And I'll come to that in a little bit. And thirdly, for many parents, a cannulation, you know, a brief, uh, you know, stay in the hospital of even an hour or so uh, is really not as preferable as compared to oral iron. As of today, we have probably 400 preparations of oral iron in the Indian market. Many of them are irrational and actually as per the Drug Controller Authority, it should not even be there. It's just that it is just a tonic or a supplement 
and has never undergone the scrutiny that many other drugs that we in hematology oncology use. It is a huge market. So in 2012, a study estimated it to be a 900 CR market in India, and with an annual growth estimated at 15%, it's currently a over 2,000 crore market. So it's a huge market, and I think some more science really needs to go into it. So in terms of treating with oral iron, very briefly, ferrous form is better absorbed. So for my, all my pediatric colleagues who may be listening to this, we can straight away jump any Previc preparations. Previc carboxyisomaltose, IV preparation is completely different, but uh, in terms of GI absorption, ferrous forms are much superior to ferric forms. And the commonest one in the market have been sulfate, fumarate, gluconate, and ascorbate. Each of these are fairly acceptable and have e virtually equal bioavailability. And these are all acceptable. I could find only one study that shows relative absorption and that lists ferrous ascorbate as really quite high. And as this also has less GI disturbance, uh, this is somehow one of the most preferred risks. But what we need to remember, any of those four salts are okay, but what are not acceptable are iron polymaltose complex. And despite repeated guidelines, these are continued to be uh, in circulation, many of these products have very similar names to ferrous ascorbate. So, you know, even if we are prescribing that, our patient may end up getting this colloidal iron. And tonopheron is the number one uh, product that has been prescribed in, you know, by pediatrics because somehow that entered our vocabulary as we were training. Taziron, most of our my pediatric colleagues will like agree is the most marketed, you know, this is and um, its virtues are counted endlessly as to what a wonderful product it is, but it is a ferric salt, the dose is grossly inadequate. In By US FDA, it is not even licensed as a medicine, but as a food supplement. So it may be, it may be adequate to give you your recommended dietary allowance, but cannot definitely treat moderate to severe iron deficiency. Fancy products, iron amino acid conjugates um, are okay. They are not bad. They have nothing, but they, they are much more expensive and offer no real advantage. Uh, again, carbonyl iron, no real advantage, but it has been used in fortification many times uh, because it does not discolor the food product so much. The entry coated and delayed release iron supplements, whether it is for children or adults, are marketed as um, you know being very GI friendly and leading to improved compliance, but really uh, iron is absorbed in proximal duodenum. So if it's released uh, or delayed form or lower down in the intestine, it is really not going to be uh, absorbed much. So what is the current recommended dose? The traditional doses are have been three to six mg per kg of elemental iron. But current guidelines and current evidence says that 2 mg per kg per day may be equally efficacious and it improves patient compliance, reduces GI symptoms. So 2 is currently the rec 2 mg per kg for treatment is the current recommended dose for oral iron supplements. Uh, endless debate on whether it should be given once a day, twice a day, thrice a day, alternate day. And studies really give fairly conflicting evidence on, on this. Um, some studies have shown that a single morning dose and alternate day dosing better. A more intense reticulocytosis has been documented in patients receiving twice daily. Uh, another study demonstrated equivalent efficacy of once or twice day, uh, daily iron dosing. Uh, but the overall thing, and some studies have also shown better, uh, you know, this thing with the alternate day dosing, and that's, on, that's the basis on which the National Iron Plus initiative was based. Uh, but single dose, really anything in multiple doses reduces compliance. So single dose is the preferred uh, you know, plan. And I think this was also already highlighted. Again, endless debate on whether it needs to be given empty stomach. Well, we know that absorption is slightly better if given empty stomach, but it is better tolerated after a meal. And with or without food, yes, there is a difference, but I think compliance is more important. So whatever works for the patient and for children, we currently recommend administration of the drug in the evening. So there is no 
you know, child rushing to school and, you know, struggling with multiple things at the same time and giving it after dinner once a day at 2 mg per kg significantly improves GI tolerance and compliance. Uh, again, there is this uh, debate on should we give vitamin C with iron supplements because it enhances oral absorption? Uh, well, it does enhance oral absorption, but the iron, uh, you know, vitamin C content in our diet is adequate to achieve this. So the preparation, they have to have additional vitamin C, uh, are, which are more expensive, also may not necessarily offer any advantage. This study looked at it specifically uh, to supplement oral iron with or without iron C, and the efficacy was identical. Uh, again, should iron supplements contain folic acid and B12, or should these be given separately? And what about the fancier supplements which claim to have additional zinc, vitamins, and minerals? Well, the Drugs Technically and uh, Technical Advisory Board of India has recommended that. Iron supplements can only additionally should have folic acid and no other supplements. And they, they have specifically said that they should not be included, one, because they are not, uh, they are really not, it's not possible to add them in meaningful quantities. Many of the supplements that say they have additional B12 have actually got five microgram of B12 uh, in a capsule or one microgram in a five ml uh, dose that we give to children. And it is really meaningless. So unless we really look at the fine print, we would not know how much beneficial it is. But it is recommended that oral iron supplements can have folic acid. Uh, but for everything else, you should, if you are, if it needs to be given, it should be given separately. So what is adequate response to oral iron? For mild anemia, it is recommended that we check hemoglobin after four weeks. But for moderate to severe, we should begin to have a response within one week. So children who have moderate to severe iron deficiency anemia, but do not show an increase in hemoglobin of at least a gram in two weeks, we need to start exploring either poor compliance, you know, impaired tolerance or any other cause, our diagnosis really, or any other cause for inadequate response. So the, the common reasons for failure to respond are, you know, number one, poor compliance, persistent or, rec or unrecognized blood loss, Uncorrected association as deficiency, uh, impaired GI absorption, which may be because of prolonged anti-acid use, H. pylori, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, or any form of entropathy, incorrect diagnosis, and very rarely uh, the genetically inherited iron resistant, iron refractory, iron deficiency anemia. So this, this is the cohort where we really need something better and the oral iron may not be adequate. The IV iron, and I will confine the rest of it, the maximum experience in children has been with iron sucrose, uh, which was not like very much because multiple sittings were required. But I, um, ferric carboxymaltose has really given an opportunity to treat many uh, sub-cohorts of children who can benefit from this problem. In Europe, it is licensed for children over the age of 14 years. Uh, in USA, by US FDA, it has recently been approved for anybody above the age of one. So our in indications for parental iron in children are poor adherence or intolerability, which is you know, relatively a much lower proportion compared to adults. Need for rapid replenishment of hemoglobin and iron stores rather than you know having several months, and this may be in a pre-operative situation. Ongoing blood loss that really exceeds the capacity that we can meet with oral iron replacement. Iron malabsorption due to GI disorders and inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease is the commonest in this category. Coexisting inflammatory state, as has already been highlighted. Chronic renal disease, which has not been addressed, but it is one of the very major indications for IV iron in children. And again, you know, iron, the genetic conditions, which are refractory to oral iron. Uh, in a retrospective review amongst children aged three months to 18 years that required IV iron, uh, more than three, I mean, about three fourths were related to chronic renal disease. So for us, that is the number one indication to consider and administer. IV iron. About 8% were due to malabsorptive states. 5% were due to ongoing blood losses. 
genetic causes are extremely rare, but 8% were unresponsive to oral iron due to poor compliance or side effects. And as you can appreciate that this is much smaller, but that is still in terms of the prevalence of anemia in childhood is still becomes a sizable population in itself. So for IV uh, carboxymaltose in children, the data is limited. Um, and most of it is confined to case series or retrospective studies. And it has, it has largely been data in cohorts known to have poor response to oral iron. What, you know, as pediatric hematologists, what we would really, you know, love to know or have the information is that if we could give it in patients with severe anemia, uh, what would be the, you know, absolute response time? Could we avert transfusions in some, in those patients? And we continue to need to give transfusion sometimes to just children with just nutritional anemia. And that data at the moment does not exist, but hopefully it will emerge. Even this large study that was alluded to earlier with uh, about 1,800 patients uh, with real world data from India with IVFCM has children only above the age of 14 years, but that cohort had similar response to adults. So only three studies have actually compared IV um, iron, IVFCM to another preparation. So a prospective study um, in Crohn's disease compared uh, IVFCM to iron sucrose, and there were similar improvements in median hemoglobins, making IVFCM the logical choice because it's a one, one sitting administration. A retrospective case series of 28 children with restless leg syndrome and ferritin less than 50 received a single dose of FCM on, or, or oral iron. And in this specific cohort, um, the, you know, the restless leg syndrome resolved in all children who received the IV preparation. And at eight weeks, ferritin level were higher in this group. Another study again looked at restless sleep disorders. So these are children who did not necessarily have anemia or at least had very mild anemia. So in another retrospective study, the response, again with restless sleep disorder, the response was superior uh, to oral supplementation. Uh, this is one of the largest study of IVFCM response in children. It is retrospective data of 144 children. Um, it was, you know, at that point, it was an off-label use, but was considered necessary. And the response was seen in about 85%. And no major adverse events were documented in this large, relatively large data. Uh, this review was, you know, has been published online only yet, and uh, but should be coming out shortly. And that is the largest system, you know, review of all the information that is there about IV FCM in children. And it overall, it summarizes that it is, you know, up, in general, about 85% of those re respond. And largely, it has been given for children with specific indications that make them poor responders to oral iron. And again, highlights the relative safety of this agent. So the overall recommendation from this uh, systematic review was that it is appropriate first-line treatment for specific patient cohorts in children including those with GI disorder, chronic renal disease, restless leg syndrome, and children on long-term TPM. But it provides also provides an alternative option that can be considered as second-line therapy when oral iron therapy has been uh, unsuccessful. The safety data is similar to adult population. Um, about 5% have been shown to develop an allergic reaction, but fairly mild, and I have did not come across any single case of anaphylaxis as such. This is thought to be, the reactions are thought to be complemented, mediated. Routinely, no pre-medication is recommended in children, but those who have severe bronchial asthma, history of drug allergies, inflammatory arthropathies, of the current guidelines recommend, we could consider pre-medication or at least have it readily available prior to uh, administering this. But overall, the reactions are much less. One thing that concerns us very significantly is the hypophosphatemia. In this one study, 225 children, um, 44 of them actually developed hypo, hypophosphatemia, and seven of them were symptomatic, largely like adults, it was uh, asymptomatic. So 
it is important at least in children who may have you know hypophosphatemia anyway to just look at this is fortification the way forward because if most of the country is anemic then we you know just giving supplementation may not be you know, the logical choice so it is logical iron fortification is currently mandatory in 81 countries across the across the world but compared to iodinization it has been much more difficult to do because of unacceptable sensory and color changes and whatever you know the practice has shown that the benefit is is fairly modest despite nationwide uh, iron fortification the government of india however is on course to uh, implement this it has already been implemented in madhya pradesh and by 2024 it will be mandatory pan india in all social safety schemes not all nutritionists agree that that is the way forward so there is you know some it is a relatively contentious issue but it is about to be happened. so uh, to summarize iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia continue to be a major public health problem in india the adverse effects in children may go much beyond anemia children in general tolerate oral iron much better than adults the newer or more expensive oral products really offer no advantage. IV iron can be considered as frontline replacement therapy for specific indications and its second line treatment for the smaller proportion with intol. What we can all agree on is that India needs ironization. How we go about it and can, we can continue to play. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Amita, for bringing up the pediatric perspective and also highlighting various studies in this group. Uh, so this was a very, very educational exercise. I learned a lot, and I'm sure that there may be some gray areas where our uh, faculty present over here as discussants will like to interact, or if they have some varied experience, they'd like to share it. So we'll use the raise hand sign, starting with Dr. Nikhil. You may address the question to a particular specific speaker. I would like to thank all the speakers for the excellent and comprehensive coverage of FCM and iron deficiency anemia in general. Uh, my question to Dr. Amit, uh, in patients with ongoing GI blood loss, like inflammatory bowel disease, how do you monitor patients after giving ferric carboxymaltose? Uh, whether they are monitored with ferritin, TSAT, or a rise in hemoglobin, and if required, how often can FCM be repeated and in what doses? And my second question to him, uh, as you have rightly mentioned, sir, the prevalence of reactions to FCM is quite rare, but in our practice, we have seen quite a few reactions to FCM, and even one patient who had a severe anaphylaxis went on to be on ventilator support. So my question would be, sir, uh, does it have anything to do with the concentration or the duration like it was mentioned by the speaker? And in a patient with reaction to ferric carboxymaltose, would alternatives like ferric, uh, like iron isomaltoside be useful? And uh, I have one question to Dr. Gopinathan, uh, who mentioned about iron deficiency anemia in systemic diseases. Uh, sir, what is your opinion about combining ferric carboxymaltose with high dose erythropoietin in these patients and are there any trials which have looked at the same thank you so amit first you tell us about uh, the monitoring in a person who has got continuous gi bleeding thank you for that fantastic question actually i went through one of the article regarding the inflammatory bowel disease those patients who are with ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease they have got ongoing bleed Plus, they have got high hepatitis levels that causes functional iron deficiency. And what was written was one of the articles which I came across that you have to monitor every three months with the serum ferritin levels. Now, here the cutoff of ferritin level is different. It's not the same as we are doing for other diseases. Now, here the serum ferritin is less than 100. They are taking this cutoff. So any patients who have got received ferric carboxymaltose for inflammatory bowel disease, we need to cut off the serum ferritin level every three months to look at whether it is going less than 100 or not. Once it is less than 100, what is recommended is to give just 500 milligram of IV ferric carboxymaltose, that's all, not more than that. That will maintain the amount of ferritin level as a store. And before the real true iron deficiency anemia takes place, 
okay, where you have to give so much amount, high amount of high dose of ferric carboxymaltose, 1500 milligram, 2000 milligram, that will not be required. So every three to six months, we can come across, every patient is different. So what I do in my setting is, I just monitor every three months, first of all. If by three months, for example, say the ferritin is 200, I recheck again at six months. And at six months, if it is going less than 100, that is the time that he's going to require IV iron therapy, 500 milligram every three to six months. So that a cutoff time period I get by monitoring just the serum ferritin levels. So that is the how we are monitoring in inflammatory bowel disease. You can read up in wonderful article uh, has been published online regarding monitoring of serum iron therapy with serum ferritin levels every three to six months in a patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah. The question was. So uh, sec second question to Amit was. Uh, sir, my second question was regarding reactions to FCM, sir. How often have you encountered reactions? Like we have had a patient who had severe anaphylaxis, went on to be on ventilator, was salvaged. But how often do you see reactions? And in such patients, would you consider giving alternative iron preparations like iron isomaltoside? True. So uh, re regarding the adverse reactions which do take place with ferric carboxymaltase, it is seen about 2 to 4% of patients, but has nothing to do with, again, doses of which. Suppose at 500 milligram, also the same reaction can take place. 1,000, also the same reaction can take place. So there's nothing to do with the dose, nothing to do with, again, the duration also. From normally recommended duration is 15 minutes. You can go up to one hour, you can go up to one and a half hour, you can go up to two hours also. So nothing to do with that. But some patients do have this. So what I have studied also right now is about uh, using this ferric isomaltoside. That is an upcoming new therapy where the structure is a little bit different, actually. And the reactions, those patients who are getting reactions on ferric carboxymaltose, they tend to have much less reaction with ferric isomaltoside because of the difference in the structure, uh, which is framed, the carbohydrate shell, which has been framed with ferric, carbo uh, ferric isomaltoside. So that is what the difference I am doing for those patients who are developing the reactions. Okay, there was another question to Dr. Gopinathan. Yeah, uh, uh, I have a question, Dr. Nickel. So, uh, regarding re replacing iron, I mean, ferrous carboxymaltose and erythropoietin, so when we identify these patients in absolute iron deficiency, so the better strategy would be to put uh, make them iron replete first by giving ferrous carboxymaltose and then subsequently take up them for e EPO. But most common practice that what we see in, in CKD patients when these patients undergo chronic dialysis, you see them having both prescriptions of both iron as well as uh, erythropoietin together. So in these patients where it is difficult to closely monitor them, they may not be regularly sending referrals to us at every 15 days to one month. So it is better uh, because these patients are at prone to iron loss as well at regular intervals. Yes. So for these patients, it is better to put them both at the same time where we where there is a component of EPO deficiency as well as there is a component of iron and deficiency, it's better to place them on both for the optimal hemoglobin achievement. And so what dose of EPO and frequency do you normally use for these patients? Is it the same as uh, CKD or in uh, other chronic diseases, it would be different? We can start at a very, very uh, low dose, like 50. You can start it as low as 50 international units per kg per week and we can titrate it maximum of two 150 units per kg per week in two dividend doses. So the optimal response to achieve a response, you can wait up to eight weeks for achieving an optimal response to erythropoietin. Yes, and uh, just one more query, sir. Many of these hospitalized patients uh, whom we get a consult, many of them have chronic diseases, anemia, chronic inflammation. At the same time, they have active infections also. So would you go ahead with correcting the iron deficiency in these patients or would you wait for the infection to be treated and patient to get symptomatically better before starting them on therapy. Yeah, this has been a really a concern in our ICU patients. What I usually suggest is uh, till the clearance of infection. So usually I give them a liberal time of 14 days time. So till either yes. till the clearance of uh, infection or, or till an anticipated period of 14 days, we'll wait for the iron correction. It's not urgency. So till that time we can manage with either top of transfusion. When the patients are critically ill, transfusion works much better. So right. once after, since always this, there is a theoretical risk of iron causing free radical injury and all this at the time of infection, it's better to withhold during that point of time and subsequently replace it when they are about to be discharged. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Meshra. Sir, thank you for the opportunity. My question is to Dr. Malika Arjun. 
this is a theoretical question like uh, in U USA FDA pregnancy categories uh, they are written as the animal reproduction studies have shown an adverse effect on the fetus and there uh, there is no adequate uh, or well controlled studies in humans so uh, elevated iron during 3 to 8 weeks of a embryonic period of human gestation may be teratogenic so my question is should we avoid avoid iv iron in particular period during first trimester Yes, good afternoon, doctor. Thank you for the question. Yes, all IV iron usage in pregnancy, very clearly recommendations are not to use them in the first trimester. We could use oral iron, but certainly no intravenous or parental iron in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And most safety data and recommendations are for usage in second and third trimester. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Thank you, Dr. Nishat. Yeah. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, my question is to Dr. Ami. Apart from uh, allergic reactions and uh, hypo anaphylaxis, uh, hypophosphatemia is one of the uh, common complications of uh, giving IV iron, ferric uh, carboxy monitors. So, in your practice, do you monitor for phosphorus? And have you come across uh, you know, patients uh, having uh, symptomatic hypophosphatemia, that is, osteomalacia, fractures, severe fatigue because of phosphorus deficiency? Thanks for the question, Dr. Nishad. In, in my practice, I have never monitored for phosphorus till now. It is all literature based and database, but I have never seen any patient who, whomever I have given IV iron therapy, IV fatty carboxy maltose with hypophosphatemia anytime. So I don't know whether Agarwal sir has seen or not. I don't know. Sir, your views? I don't think we monitor this anytime. And I also must say that this subject was not emphasized until the isomaltose came in the picture. And they sort of uh, talked about it left and right in all the studies. So clinically, uh, fatigue has not been a big issue. Symptoms of hypophosphatemia are very vague. Fractures, etc., that you are talking about is almost unheard of. And uh, all said and done, I think this is a little bit of... Uh, uh, sort of competition between the two uh, manufacturers. No, it's not a clinical issue. Sir, I have another question. Uh, in patients with any of chronic disease, uh, you know, uh, in our in your practice, are you monitoring the serum transferring receptors? Uh, is it available and how useful it is in treating uh, practically? Gopinathan. So, serum transferrin receptor is, I mean, uh, we don't actually, in my practice, I don't routinely monitor it, but it is used for clinically differentiating between IDA and CI. So, practically, access to that is different. Most of the time, we, are, I mean, based on the IN parameters and the red blood cell morphology, we try to put them into this picture, efficient picture versus the inflammatory picture, and try to manage. Access to these tests, uh, I mean, personally, I haven't used. So, Nisha, the test has become available at least in Mumbai. At Hinduja Hospital, it's available. Standalone labs, including Metropolis, is uh, doing this, which you can always do from any part of the country. Uh, besides the guidelines that Dr. Gopinathan gave you, transferring saturation, the ferritin level, uh, in hospital practice, it becomes extremely difficult because a lot of patients have systemic diseases. And when their hemoglobin is low, you're not very sure whether they've got associated iron deficiency or not. This becomes a useful parameter to add to what over and above what Dr. Gopinathan said. So you can uh, use at least Metropolis lab for this. Thank you so much. Dr. Sujata. Uh, thank you, sir. It was a very uh, thought-provoking lecture for, uh, especially when the disease is so common in pediatric age group. Uh, I just want to ask to Dr. Ganesh that uh, in uh, cancer patients where we want to decrease iron transfusion, uh, uh, blood transfusion, uh, these patients come with febrile neutropenia as well as uh, iron uh, means anemia. So in that condition, how are we going to um, give iron as an IV iron uh, when uh, there, is, there is an infection and how do we consider that uh, a free radical injury due to infections? So both conditions, how do we balance? Madam, for that question, actually, when I was going through the literature, that was my dilemma. Also, patients with sepsis, patients with uh, yeah. inflammation. 
so uh, it has been nicely elaborated through various uh, you know trials and studies so anemia of systemic disease they have you know active inflammation still the iv iron and this particularly the newer iron molecules like fcm or isomaltoside the free radical release or non transparent bind, uh, bound uh, labile iron release is very very low so they are safe per se as per the literature though i didn't had any experience of using in persons with active infection uh, but uh, we have used in icu setting in many patients patients with sepsis mods uh, patients with uh, uh, various uh, uh, resolving infections but as your point of using it in acutely you know sick patient uh, you know you have to choose case to case but there is literature support of using iv iron these newer molecules even in the acutely infected uh, patients or patients with ongoing uh, inflammation okay i think then we can consider when they are not uh, culture positive uh, cases or not very severe neutropenic conditions and anemia mostly Correct. that initially yeah okay. so i didn't have time to project the data from hematological malignancies like leukemia lymphoma myeloma there is a robust data so in fact one of the surrogate markers of using iv iron in functional iron deficiency you know the surrogate marker of fcd in is that inflammatory you know para, like markers like crp if a patient mm -hmm. has high crp and uh, transferrin saturation less than 50 you can still iv iron can be used to improve the hemoglobin and the overall well being of the patient so when high crp you are using probably we can use it in acutely infected patients also okay let us see this okay thank you <coughs> one more thing when we are talking about anemia of cancer we are mm. basically talking of anemia of metastatic solid tumors and yeah. patients on chemotherapy uh, all this data does not apply to hematological malignancies say acute leukemia lymphoma or myeloma patients having of course in pediatric and subacute leukemia uh, this data does not apply there their anemia is basically as a part of hematopoietic failure so that's right. a different cup of tea all together uh, one doesn't talk about iron replacement therapy there at all so it's yeah. totally different yeah okay so thank you thank you i don't see any other raise hand sign is there anyone else who would like to ask any question so dr akshay Good afternoon, sir, and thank you to all the speakers for the wonderful lecture. I have just one general question in mind: that in a young adult patient who has no other comorbidity but just iron deficiency anemia and has received one dose of FCM, how frequently you follow up this patient, and is there any specific time interval to be kept between two doses of FCM? Whom do you want to answer this question? Uh, Dr. Amit Khurana. Right. So, patient is young, fit patient received one dose of uh, FCM and the full dose of FCM. What I do is basically I usually monitor the CBC hemoglobin after two to three weeks. If there is improvement in hemoglobin of one to one to one point five grams, that means the patient has responded. At day seven of FCM, we do monitor the reticulocyte count. and once the reticulocyte response is there after one week at least my patient is responded i do check after about one to two months what is the hemoglobin values i do not usually recheck the serum ferritin value until there is again a, a deficiency of hemoglobin is going down in this patients so i do not monitor with the ferritin levels if the patient has got no other comorbidities but i do just check on the hemoglobin values every first after 3 to 4 weeks and then after every 2 to 3 months and then 3 to 4 months and so on okay thank you sir so dr akshay the rate of rise of hemoglobin depends upon your initial weight if your initial hemoglobin is say 3 grams then you will have a very brisk response while if your initial hemoglobin is say 11 grams then you are going to have a very sedate response but all the patients must show some increment at 2 weeks thank you sir Uh, sometimes reticulocytosis may not be that brisk for you to pick it up in the lab unlike megaloblastic anemia where you know day 4 day 5 is also helpful and normalization of hemoglobin takes place in 2 months 
once again, irrespective of where you started. Even if it was two grams, it will take two months. You started with 11 grams, it will take two months because then the rate of rise is slow there. Uh, if there is no increment at two weeks, and if there is no active bleeding going on, then you doubt the diagnosis. And same thing about hemoglobin has not normalized in two months, then you find out the cause. Is there again ongoing bleeding? There's some infection inflammation, or you're entirely on the wrong diagnosis. So that is how you can monitor it very easily. And Kurana said very rightly, you don't have to bother about monitoring parity or iron unless you get into this situation where response was inadequate in a searching for the etiology. And uh, one question that was asked earlier was about uh, somebody who's got GI problem or active GI bleeding. Uh, one of the condition that you face is rarely, but is hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, where there's going to be a lifelong uh, GI bleeding. And these patients sometimes need IV FCM almost every month to avoid blood transfusion. From that context, I have one question to all those who answered this uh, question about uh, IV iron in uh, infected patients or in ICU patients. Uh, if somebody needs blood transfusion versus iron, what is more dangerous? What will you choose? You have time for the iron to work, but you're scared of giving iron because of infection versus that you are going to give blood transfusion because there is a component of hypoxia. I found no answer from the literature over there. There's only vague replies. Anyone want to take it up? What do you do in your practice? You go with blood transfusion or you go ahead with the IVI? But if it is a crisis situation, you will need a transfusion because you want the response instantly. And, uh, you know, the IV iron also will still take two weeks to give you a response. So at least in the ICU setting, it's not going to get us out. If we are addressing it along with the other critical care issues, that's a difference. So there is a lot of discussion in the intensivist about the hemoglobin level in the critically ill patient. And the consensus is that you do not need immediate correction of hemoglobin. Yeah. Seven, seven is the cutoff they are because there is a lot of um, transfusion related morbidity in a critical care setting. And the same is for children also. Seven is our cutoff, which is even more conservative than you would do otherwise. So ICU is even more conservative. Absolutely. So I often don't bother about this risk that was talked about and I give IVIN if the hemoglobin is seven plus. Uh, there are some questions. Is there any other question from the faculty here before I go to the questions in the question box? Most of the answers in the questions in the question box have been already dealt with, so I'm not going to uh, repeat them. There are some questions about relative safety and efficacy of isomaltose versus FCM. Uh, I can just uh, tell you that both are good preparations. Rest everything is pharmacological gimmicks. Um, there is one question about at what level of ferritin you will not give IV iron. So we heard that about 800 as the cutoff from Gopinathan. Uh, anybody wants to discuss or argue that? At particular level of ferritin above which you will never give IV iron. Some of us may be more conservative. You may not even wait up to 800 may not be very comfortable giving even above 500. You look at transferring saturation, you look at soluble transfer receptor assay, you look at the clinical situation of the patient, and then if you're not comfortable, then you don't give. Uh, I don't think there is any other exciting question. All related to pregnancy have been answered. So I think that's about all. So if there is no other question, this is part two. two. Thank you very much for sparing your Sunday morning. We had a very exciting discussion and uh, large number of listeners also, large number of uh, discussions here, and the faculty did a great job. And have a wonderful time with your family on a Sunday after. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. Do we, do Thank we, you, sir. Do we have the sponsors to say the, give the official vote of thanks? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, ah, okay, you do it. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving us this opportunity to facilitate the academic uh, discussion, which is very consistent since last two years.
no other society is very prominent like this so i must compliment to you and all the participant as well as all the doctors who is supporting the scientific phase sir uh, with this uh, we just wants to announce that we are uh, launching ncar 750 mg in month of april 2023 this month only for the ease of administration administration for the hematologist sir so hematologist generally prefers 1500 mg so we are launching 750 mg so it would be very easy for them to titrate the dose on a weekly basis or a monthly basis based on the requirement thank you so much we will try to innovate all the things in the in the coming future as per the clinician's requirement we are working on mcl lower strength also very aggressively very soon we will give you uh, we will give you some good news sir so something positive which is coming up in next 3 to 4 months time sir thank you so much thank you sir thank you kayu and about your statement why do we do these webinars someone had mentioned that at any age of your life if you attend a lecture and if there was one statement or one sentence which was new and which was information to you then it was worth attending the lecture and last 3 years i must tell you that each and every webinar i had not one not two but probably 10 sentences and 10 messages that i learned at the age of 71 years so these have been very fruitful it's a selfish interest that i want others to prepare and teach me i can't go anywhere so they come here and they teach me and that has been extremely helpful to little bit add to my knowledge also to anchor and uh, ahmed khurana must have witnessed the same you got to read yourself so when there is a particular webinar you read and prepare so that you know you are not uh, become a red faced person over there sometimes questions are put to you as well so thank you for supporting us because without support we can't do these webinars thank you and thanks to everybody bye bye thank you